think um, I think the piece of scripture that I kind of picked out this morning for for communion very fitting for Christmas since you know today is the day we celebrate Jesus coming and it's more than just the birth of a baby there's more to the story of Christmas. And unfortunately, I left my glasses sitting there, so it might be a struggle. But I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews 2. celebrating with the Lord's Supper, I was kind of zoned out. Uh, I think that happens a lot. I was deep in thought, thinking about the sermon, and what Christmas is. You know, we're gonna, I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. I, I think it's a very fitting piece of scripture for communion on Christmas Sunday. It reads, now since the children have flesh and blood in common, Jesus also shared in these, so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power over death, that is the devil, and free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. For it is clear that he does not reach out to help angels, but to help Abraham's offspring. Therefore he had to be like his brothers in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tested and suffered, he is able to help those who are tested. He suffered for us. He was born to suffer. Born to make peace. <coughs> Let that be your thought. Let that be your prayer this morning at communion. Amen. Who is he in yonder stop?
sent her away. We thank you, Lord, being able to get out of that rain, Lord, to come out and be able to worship you, Father. We thank you for this day that we do celebrate, that we celebrate the birth of your son Jesus. But if he wasn't born, then he wouldn't have died for us. And we thank you for that. We thank you for this communion that we have to partake each and every Sunday. We thank you for this love and for this cup. Father, I thank you, God, for those who came out this day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Father God, we just ask your blessings upon us now at this time as we've gathered around this table to remember that ultimate sacrifice that was given for each and every one of us just because you love us so. Father God, if it wasn't for your love, we would be nowhere. Father God, as we are partaking of these emblems, may we look back upon our lives to, to think about the things that we've done, the, the areas that we fell at, Father, that uh, right now we can confess to you and ask you to help us to strive to be more like you. Father God, we thank you on this Christmas day. We thank you for sending your son into this world to save it. Father, we love you. In Jesus' name I pray.
Father, we do give back such a small portion. But Father, we oftentimes overlook that you want us to give all that we have. But Father, I pray here this morning that, that we as a congregation can do just that. Father, through our monies, Father, through our time, our effort, Father, through the time that we spend with you in prayer and studying, Father, I pray that we do give it our all. And Father, that we as a congregation, as individuals, Father, in this congregation, that we strive to do what's right and what's holy in your eyes. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you for this time to give. In Jesus' name. Remember a young child in the first grade at Wayne Camp Elementary? God knows who he is. And uh, Johnny Shavies. That's uh, my daughter in law's dad. He's 
dealing with one thing. Too. We have any other? We don't have any others, so let's, let's spend some time in prayer. Father, we thank you for this day, and we, we thank you for being able to be together. Being able to be together to celebrate and to remember when you came to earth live with us. And Father, we we pray for all these, whether it's sickness, decisions, recovery, whatever. You know the needs, you know what is best. Father, we ask that that your glory is shown, whether it is through healing or, or what. That confidence and decisions can be made. We pray for wisdom, but most importantly, we pray for discernment. To know and understand your will. We ask for peace in hearts, peace in minds, and just the hope for the promise that through all and in all, you are greater than anything we face. And by your strength, you can lead us through. We thank you for this wonderful day to stay if we can just be together as you would be. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. celebration from a non-Christian Christmas celebration. But sometimes we just take our focus on who the day is about, who we are celebrating, and what we are celebrating. You know, and as I've said a couple times before, this is probably, well, this is the first, first time in a few years that I've actually had the Christmas spirit, the Christmas whatever you want to call it. Um, 
Not that I was really Scrooge, but let's just say I wasn't far from being Scrooge. You know, and I think there's a change of perspective. You know, I, I think Jennifer and I, as I've said before, Jennifer and I, I, th I think we're, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn saying this, I, I think we're in a good place, a good place in life. We're in a good, good season of life, whatever you want to call it. Plus, we're also in a good place, as in where we are. You know, it's, we're with a group of people with a church who wants more than just status quo. We want to be something greater than just a group of people who meet on Sunday or Wednesday. You know, look at some of the things we've done this Christmas. You know, we 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 spent time at the uh, the nursing home, which was fun. It was a good day, a real good day. Um, through our partner commission encounters, we were able to give out a lot of needed stuff and to help a lot of people and through others who gave things. We were able to help a lot of people. You know, letting people understand and see that Christmas is more than just what you wrap up and stick underneath the tree. That there's more to Christians at Christmas than a Christmas tree in, your, in the church. That we actually go out and do what we're called to do and who we are called to be. You know, and, and it's and it's good to see it. And it's good to be a part of it. You know, that's one of those things that's kind of kind of helped me get out of this ah, so this is Christmas type of attitude. Where Christmas is just just a day. You know, we, we had we had a really good Christmas cantata. We had an outstanding play last night. And, and we and we, on Sunday I think we've had I think we've had a good time on Sunday mornings. We we learned a few things differently about some shepherds. Uh, you know we spent some time with Simeon and Anna. And last week we took a look at the Magi. You know it's been good. It's been a good Christmas. It's been a real good Christmas. You know and, and I think we saw that through all these guests that we looked at we have something in common with. We have a lot in common. Whether we were called from far off, or whether we were kind of on the edge of society, so to speak, or maybe we were just close, but we were all called to Jesus to be a messenger for Jesus. Christmas. The story of Jesus. The story of Jesus. But you know, even with all that, and all the good things, sometimes... The old attitude kind of creeps in where Christmas is ah, just Christmas. You know, we're we'll do all this stuff, we'll do all these things, we'll we'll, we'll start planning for Christmas a month, two months out, buying gifts and all this stuff. And it just becomes a big rush of events and, and everything just goes all crazy. But then when it comes to Good Friday and Easter, we just kind of I'll stop. I'll stop right there because it kind of gets the, the old bah humbug attitude going again. But, you know, it's that's a little weird thing about Christmas. And this morning we're going to look at something a little different. And if you look in the bulletin, there's actually scripture in there. Right? What we're going to look at. It's a novel idea. <laughs> it might happen more often. We're going to look at... John, the Gospel. We're going to look at the Christmas story in John. John chapter 1, verse 14. The Christmas story in John. You might be sitting there going, oh, come on, man, there, there is no Christmas story in the book of John. Yes, there is. There's also a Christmas story in the book of Mark, but you've got to know where to look to find it there. We're going to look at the Christmas story from the, from the Gospel of John, from John's perspective, and see what we can learn about it. You know, and... You see the title of the sermon in there, So This Is Christmas. And yes, I stole that from John Lennon from his Christmas song. He's not my favorite Beatle either. I would read the words, but it's kind of a, a depressing song. It's not really 
what Christmas is about. See, so we're going to look at John chapter 1, verse 14. So if you would, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Stand for the reading of God's word. John chapter 1, verse 14. <clears throat> the word became flesh and took up residence among us. We observed his glory, the glory as the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for your Son. I thank you for the opportunity to celebrate and remember his birth, but more importantly, to celebrate and remember who he was and who he is. And I ask, Father, that you open up our eyes and open up our heart to see that Christmas is more. It's more than just the day to remember your birth. For it is in your son Jesus' name. We pray. Amen. This is the verse that changed my perspective on Christmas, and it's been there for a long, long, long time. We're going to look at it, and maybe three more. Maybe. I really haven't decided. That's when I was sitting there when I got kind of lost uh, between singing and communion time. I was trying to decide if I really want to go to the other three verses or if I want to stay with this one. We're going to figure it out at some point. I might mention the other three. Might not. If you don't get there, it's no big deal. Because this verse is the one that's important. This verse is Christmas. The entire Christmas story is summed up in this one verse. This one verse from the Gospel of John. You look at the opening line. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. The story of Christmas. Right there. See, John, when he opens up this, when he opens up his gospel, John spends the first 13 verses, the first 13 verses, talking about the Word. How the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's how he starts. And then in this verse we see it goes back to it, the word. See, but what happens in, in these thir 13 verses where verse, uh, verse 1 where John starts out with, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. What, what, he's, what he does for the next 12 verses until he, get, until he gets to verse 14, so the, those 13 verses in total, he's talking about the word as being the creator. It was rejected. A visitor, it's soul life, and it's soul saving. But there's, some, there's something really interesting in here. In these 13 verses, see, John, John never talks about the word ever being human in the first 13 verses. He does use a lot of personal pronouns, but he doesn't talk about the word being human. You know, he, he's, talked about the, he's talked about the word being God, and that he is the, the dynamic, creative, all powerful force in the universe who, who holds everything together and who even gave man reason. But he never mentions him ever being in the flesh. It's interesting. See, then he drops down and we see in verse 14. Christmas. The word became flesh and took up residence among us. God became human, became flesh and blood, and became one of us and lived with us. Became flesh. See, there's an issue with this verse, so you can look. You can look at some other. Modern translations of the Bible, and it'll say, and the word became human, or the word became man. No kidding. No kidding. It became human. It became flesh. See, but what's missed when we take out this word flesh is there's something important John was trying to convey to people. 
See, there was this thinking back in the day, it was Gnosticism, that th these folks didn't believe that Jesus actually came in the flesh. That he only appeared to be human, that he wasn't really human. See, so John writes this, and he also writes his letters to com combat a lot of heresy, and this was the major heresy, that Jesus didn't come in the flesh, he only looked like it. So if Jesus never came in the flesh, then why are we celebrating Christmas? Why does the writer of Hebrews, which I read this morning, say that for us to be saved, Jesus had to be like one of us? Christmas. God coming in the flesh. You know, you can look all through the New Testament and see where it's written that the Word became flesh and lived with us. He's completely God and completely human. You know, Paul tells us that in Colossians 2 9. I'm not going to like read all these verses. If you want, you can write it down. You can go back and check me. But Paul talks about that. See, in the writer of Hebrews, which we looked at, of course, on Wednesday night, Hebrews chapter 1 tells us, Long ago, God spoke to the fathers by the prophets at different times and in different ways. This is 1 through 3. In, in the last days, he spoke to us by his Son. God has appointed him heir of all things and made the universe through him. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Christmas came. Jesus in the flesh. For us. For us. But there's something else. There's something else in there. See, this, this whole thing about Jesus coming in the flesh and, and taking up residence among us, See, it's an, old, it's an Old Testament picture. It's an Old Testament picture. Um, think back about the tabernacle. And think about the temple. What do they think happened there? In both of those places. God lived there. It was God's dwelling place. Behind the Holy of Holies. See, what happened was when Jesus came, He rendered all those things useless. Because the new tabernacle was Jesus. He came to end it all. End hostility. To bring hope. Even for those he called as a child. To come and see him. The shepherds who we saw. You know, they were considered on the fringe of society. We, we learned something different about them. That, that they knew who they saw. And, and who they were seeing. And, and then you had Simeon and Anna. And, you know, these people, like, like I said a couple of weeks ago, people probably thought they were nut jobs, hanging out in the temple all day. Waiting. But they were called. Even the Magi, they were called. Because God had come in the flesh. And he still calls today. He still calls us today. He took up residence among us. Christmas. The story of Christmas. But there's, but there's, there, there is a ton more in this verse. Trust me, I I stopped writing on this verse at 14 pages. 14 pages on how many words? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Right? Roughly 30 words in English. It's probably closer to 10 or 12 in Greek. 14 pages. And I stop. This verse is probably the greatest verse in the entire New Testament. It, it tells us everything about why Jesus came. And why we celebrate Christmas. Why we celebrate Easter. Why we, why we celebrate the Lord's Supper. It's all in this verse. The Word became flesh and took up residence among us. And we observed His glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. See, if you look at the last three words that I just read, grace and truth, it's Christmas. That is Christmas. 
the gift of grace and the bringing of truth. See, grace, grace is a complex word. Let's, let's talk about this word for a second. As it relates to Jesus and us, grace. We know a lot about grace. What do, what do we most often think about grace? And you can speak. You can speak out loud. I'm all for it. What do we think of it? It is something we don't deserve. Very true. It is very true. It is something we don't deserve. See, and it's always had that idea. It's something completely undeserved. It's always had the idea that what we are getting, we never deserve. See, the fact that God came to live with us, to die for men and women, to end the hostility between God and man is something we did not deserve. We did not deserve. It was a pure act of love on God's part. Nothing we've ever done. Nothing. Nothing we can ever do. It was an act of love on God's part. See, th this word, is, as, as John's writing, and he was full of grace and truth, these, these words, what it emphasizes is, is the fact that, that we are hopeless. Hopeless. But God has limitless kindness sent his son at Christmas for what we call Christmas. He took up flesh and dwelt among us. Christmas. See, but grace also has, has another idea. What's the other idea of grace? Just think about that. Grace. Sometimes it has to do with Charm. Grace. If you are graceful, you are. Hmm. Don't think about that when we look at grace biblically, do we? It's the beauty of God. In Jesus, we see the loveliness of God at Christmas. The day after Christmas. At Easter. Every day. We see the beauty of God. The loveliness of God in Jesus. John got to see him in the flesh. He says, We observed his glory, the glorious, the one and only Son from the Father. The loveliness of God came at Christmas. See, people back, people had always thought of God as, as this mighty, powerful force who at any moment could crush them. Who could crush them. And then Jesus comes. The scene. And you're confronted with the beauty of God. The beauty of God. That the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The beauty of God's grace. The beauty of the hope that Christmas brought. And the beauty of the hope that Christmas continues to bring every day. Every day. See, and there's another word that we need to look at too. Is that word truth? Truth. See, Jesus is the embodiment of truth. And truth came at Christmas. What, what did Jesus tell us he was in John 14, 6? I am the truth. You, you know, to see truth, we have to look at Jesus. You know, he, he's, he's so precious. And we look at him and we see the truth, the truth of God. The truth for all, for everybody, for the for, for the deepest of thinker to the simplest of minds. See, we can all understand God because we can all see Jesus. Christmas. You know, let, let's get a little more abstract. I like being abstract. Kind of different. Kind of like me. A little abstract, a little weird. <clears throat> Let, let's think about beauty. Let's go back to beauty again. Can we all come to the same definition of beauty? Yeah, we can look it up in the dictionary, but does it really mean anything to us? Now, if, and, and they're not here, uh, if the poinsettias were still here, 
we could all probably agree that's a beautiful flower, right? Or if we see someone walking down the street or standing here or a picture, and we could all agree that, oh, you know, that, that person carries himself well and will feel the way they are. See, we can get this idea of beauty. See, and it's like truth. You know, we really don't grasp the full meaning of the word truth. But when we look at Jesus, grace and truth, we see what God's like. We see what God's like. See, Jesus didn't come to just talk about God. Jesus came to show people who God is. That is Christmas. And it's not an abstract thought. It's true. Jesus came to show people who God is. The God that, as I said, the wisest of person or the simplest of mind can worship and adore because of Christmas. Because the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The story of Christmas. Jesus came to show people what God is like when he was born the child in Bethlehem. Those last three verses, we've got a couple minutes. If you want, you can flip over. It's probably a page in your Bible. It's John chapter 3, 16, 17, and 18. One of those is my favorite verse in the entire Bible. John 3, 16, 17, and 18. Maria, real quick, Christmas. It's Christmas right here in these three verses. For God loved the world this way. He gave his one and only Son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who does not believe in him is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. Christmas right there. God loved the world this way. He gave his only son for each of us. To make peace between God and man. So that we could have a right relationship with God. See, my favorite verse in the entire Bible is verse 17. John 3, 17. For God did not send his son in, into the world that he might condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Why didn't, you, why didn't Jesus come to condemn the world? Amen. We did it ourselves. Christmas. He came to save the world. And all it takes is. You know, you, you could go through life celebrating Christmas. You could even celebrate Easter and never have any idea what it is. What it is that Jesus was born to save the world. And it just takes believing in his following him, giving your life to him. Folks, that's the story of Christmas. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. So today, as we're all going out and do, doing whatever we're planning on doing, whether it's traveling down the highway back to see family. We're hanging out at the house, watching TV. Remember what Christmas is. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it's not just a day to celebrate, a time to celebrate one day a year. That is something we need to remember daily. That the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Full of grace and truth. So that we might have peace. Peace with God. So today, if today you need that peace, it's pretty simple. Give your life to God. Serve Him. Remember Christmas is your day. Is your day. So if you would, before we have a of invitation, let's let's stand. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the beauty that you are. The fact that we are celebrating that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, lived with us, dwelt with us. restore our relationship with you, to save us from our own world of destruction, to make peace, to bring hope, to give life, so that we can see who you are, and just how much you love and care for your creation to be restored to you. And Father, if I, I just pray that daily your spirit will make us aware of that fact. You came and lived with us. Father, we thank you for this lovely day. We thank you for the gift. The gift of grace that came when your son was born. And it is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.